Good day, Math 30-1s. Today we talk about radical functions. In 2.1, radical functions and, of course, transformations. This is what's new from the previous year. You looked last year a little bit about solving equations, about restrictions, and this year we build on top of that. So radical functions don't exist everywhere. They have some restrictions. So if we were to try to visualize the square root of x, it might start to make sense, but let's just try to think about what is the square root of 4? What's the square root of 9? What's the square root of 16? What's the square root of 1? Does the square root of 0 exist? Does the square root of negative 4 exist? Plugging into a calculator can give you some very clear answers, but square root of 0 is true because 0 times 0 is 0. So 0 is actually okay. Negatives start to become a bit of an issue because you can't say 2 times negative 2 to get negative 4 because they're not the same number. So we might start to see that all the x values kind of have this cutoff that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Now a good way of thinking about this is, is to simply say the inside of a radical has to be 0 or, or higher. And instead of trying to guess and check, well, what would make this hit that cutoff of 0, which is in this case a 3, why not simply say if the inside of this needs to be greater than or equal to 0, there's your domain. Just solve for x. Add a 3 over, x has to be greater than or equal to 3. There's your domain. Same thing. It gets a little bit trickier when you're dealing with more complex insides. And so let's just simply say when is 2x minus 7 greater than or equal to 0. Add the 7 over divide both sides by a 2, and quite quickly, x has to be greater than or equal to 7 over 2, or 3.5. For the last example, what we have is what will eventually become a vertical shift, but simply by sticking with the same logic, when is the inside greater than or equal to 0? It seems a bit deceptive, but it's actually quite a simple case. So let's try to visualize the square root of x. Now, typically, um, we would make a table of values, and we get to choose whatever x values we want to use. So if we were to choose a few like negative 2 and plug it in, we'd obviously have some issues with it. Same thing with negative 1, but 0 was actually OK. So I'm going to say at negative 2, we had no answer. It's not a subtraction, no answer. If we plug in a 0, a 0 comes out. Plug in a 1, a 1 comes out. And these ones these numbers are quite nice. I'm not going to select an x value of 2 though because the square root of 2 is about a 1.4 and it's kind of messy. So I'm going to switch to a nice value, x is 4, because the square root of 4 is 2. Again, not 5, not 6, not 7, not 8, but I might say the square root of 9 is 3. And we'll keep going. The square root of 16 is a 4 and the square root of 25 is a 5 and a smooth curve connecting these dots does in fact make your square root of x radical function. And we'll label it as such. Some important facts about this square root of x graph. Um, there are no negatives for x. There are no negative x values unless we start talking about shifts. It doesn't have the bottom half, but it really, really is half of a parabola. And how does it look on the calculator? If you were to try to type it in, it looks a little bit linear, but while you're hanging out, have a quick sketch in your calculator why one is the square root of x and see what it looks like. Because this is all you're going to have on a unit exam and on a diploma. So at some point, you're probably going to be typing this in. What we're going to do today, though, is we're going to talk about shifting in function notation for radical functions. So I'm going to try to keep this consistent and comfortable with what we talked about before. But we're going to start with some function, just like we sketched a moment ago, the square root of x. What do you think this would look like if we shifted it up to and right to? To make this possible, we're going to 
treat the endpoint, that vertex, as a new origin. What if we take this square root of x graph and we shift the whole thing, all those points, up to and right to? So let's go up two from the origin and write, sorry, write one. Up to write one. Now we're gonna pretend that this is the brand new origin. So we have to kind of ignore all these x values and all those y values and just count in our square root of input calculations. So here's our new origin and we're gonna go input a one, out comes a one. Notice I'm not referring to these x and y values anymore. Input a one, two, three, four, output a two. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Output a 1, 2, 3. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Output a 1, 2, 3, 4. I think that's good enough for the moment. So if we sketch from a new origin, we can make this possible. And maybe that's a little bit easier because there really is only two transformations happening. A shift and a shift, two translations. And this is the square root of x shifted right to and up to. What would this equation look like? Well, we might be able to start saying in the input position, right one. Where the x is under the bracket, that's to the right one. Up two is after the square root of x, after the input, up to. So this is what this new graph might look like. Where is our domain? Well, our domain, it looks like it's shifted one to the right. Just like our equation says, this is shifted one to the right. And we could say this exists everywhere to the right of one. For the range, it looks like this exists everywhere cut off at two and above. And this shift up two is what creates this range. Now, this is two shifts. Now, what would happen if we started to talk about some stretches? In example two, what we've got is the same a value in front of a radical, but one's a two and one's a one half. What happens for each of these scenarios? Well, when we would normally sketch our square root of x graph, um, we have our y values that cal get calculated quite quickly. If we can do a multiply by two, things occur quite conveniently. So if we have our y value of zero at the origin, two times zero is still a zero. Normally when we plug in a one, out comes a one, but we're multiplying the y value by a two. So input a one, out comes a one times two, two. Input a one, two, three, four, out comes normally a two, times two is four. Typically input a nine, out comes a one, two, three, stretched up to a six. I don't know if we can fit this on here. Input a 16, output a four, stretched up to a five, six, seven. Very conveniently, it fits there in the top. This is your vertical stretch times two. Two root x. For the example on the right, we could try this the same way and do a vertical stretch times a one half. So normally zero, zero. One, one becomes one a half. Four, two becomes a four, one. Nine, three, becomes a 9, 1.5. And 16, 4 becomes a 16, 2. And this one is a little bit trickier to sketch because it's been vertically stretched by a factor of 1 half. What we see is that the domain still exists everywhere to the right of 0, and the range still is everything above 0. So unless a shift happens, there really isn't a change to a domain in a range. We'll examine what could happen with flips a little bit later.
What you'll notice in example three from the previous example is the positioning. Now there's a 2x and there's a 1 half x. Now the difference between this and the ex last example is that the 2 is under the radical this, this time. So this is actually the square root of 2x. This is a horizontal stretch by a factor of 1 half. This one's going to be a little bit trickier to do. So normally when we say 0, 0, we're going to be now thinking about our input and multiplying it by a 1 half. So 0 times a half conveniently doesn't change. A 1, 1 has to have our input value 1 at a half. 4, 2 has the input value 4 multiplied by a half. That goes to a 2, so 2 comma 2. The input 9, output 3, has the input value 9 actually at a 4.5. The 16, 4 has the input 16 stretched back to an 8. And I think that's good enough to give us an idea of what this shape is starting to look like, but this is now a horizontal stretch by a factor of 1 half. For the example, on the right, 1 half x, what we're seeing is a horizontal stretch by a factor of 2. And similar logic, but this time multiplying all the inputs by 2. So 1, 1 is stretching horizontally from a 1 to a 2. A 4, 2 is stretching horizontally from a 4 out to an 8. And a 9, 3 is stretching out from the 9 to a 15, 16, 17, just off the grid, an 18. And this is horizontally stretching times 2. Again, noting the position of B. What's the domain? What's the range? Similarly, the domain is everything above or equal to 0 and the range is everything above or equal to zero. Nothing has really been impacted unless there's a shift from the origin or perhaps a flip, which we could examine next. In example five, which skips example four, of course, looks like there's a negative in front of the x value versus a negative under the x value. In front of the square root of x is a vertical flip so we're required to do the exact same square root of x shape, but everything should be flipped to the bottom side. So the 1, 1 is flipped to a 1, negative 1. 4, negative 2. 9, negative 3. 16, negative 4. And a smooth curve connecting all the dots. A horizontal reflection with a poorly selected graph, Mr. Lemko, starts off at a 0, 0. And if we're flipping this horizontally to the left side, we need to say 1 left, 1 up. 1, 2, 3, 4 left, 2 up. And because of my poor grid selection, we actually have that as all we can do. There is a bit of a change in your domain and your range. For the graph on the left, where does it exist for x? Well, still, x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Your input is still just an x. All the y values have been flipped upside down, so we're dealing with y values that are less than or equal to 0. For the graph on the right, the horizontal flip, our domain is actually, this time, everything less than or equal to 0 because if you see this negative x, you have to have another x value that's negative to say negative of maybe negative 4. So a negative of negative 4 is going to actually exist. Your range is everything on the positive side, everything greater than or equal to 0. Now things can get a little bit more crazy. Let's examine one where there's more things happening. So on the top of the next page in example 6, we have a transformation with a vertical flip, a horizontal stretch by a factor of 1 half, and a shift 3 up. 
So as long as we do that horizontal shift three up last, we should be okay. So let's do a vertical flip, a horizontal stretch by a factor of a half, and at the end, let's go three up. Now we can do this in multiple stages, multiple steps. And if we do a vertical flip, we're going to be dealing with this. One, negative one. Four, negative two. Nine, negative three. Sixteen, negative four. This might be your first of three steps. We've also got a horizontal stretch by one half. So maybe this has to squish together by one half. So maybe your next step would be to say, all right, this x value is gonna be multiplied by a half. This x value of four is gonna become a two. This nine becomes a 4.5. And this 16 becomes an eight. And maybe this is your next iteration. And maybe lastly, we've got to shift this three up. So your final, final, final graph, which maybe we'll give the name G, should shift all these points three up. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And lastly, one, two, three. And here is a final result, which we'll give the name G of X as a final result of three transformations. Where does this graph exist? Well, considering the domain, it looks like it exists everywhere to the right of zero. We could still use a similar logic to say, when is the inside 2x greater than or equal to zero? And in solving for x, it is still x is greater than or equal to zero. For the range, it looks like this flips upside down and is shifted three up. So I know that this has a three cutoff, and it's everywhere upside down, below, or equal to three. It takes a little bit of practice and a few examples for that to solidify. And for this question, it can, again, get a little bit more complicated, and that's why maybe we'll examine mapping notation to make this a little bit more simple than maybe the last example could have been. So what's happening? I do see there's a two in front, that's a vertical stretch, a horizontal flip, and there's a couple shifts. And a good thing the B value is factored out. So as long as we're doing the flips and the stretches first in any order, we're okay. So vertical stretch times two, a horizontal flip, a horizontal shift, three left, and we're going down one. In mapping notation, we could say that all the x and y values are, for x, horizontally flipping, and three left. Vertically, stretching times two, and down one. Let's pick a few points that are on an original square root of x graph, and then just do a couple quick ones. So zero, zero is a quick one to do. One, one, four, two, and maybe nine comma three. Not always will these values be nice or convenient, but we'll see what we can do. So x values, flipping and then subtract three. Zero flipping is still a zero, subtracting a three is a negative three. One becomes a negative one, minus three. Four becomes a negative four, minus three. Nine becomes a negative nine, subtract a three. And those are your new x values for your final graph. Y values are doubling and then subtracting one. So zero doubled is a zero minus one. One doubled is a two minus one. Two doubled is a four minus one. Nine doubled is a six, sorry, three doubled is a six minus one. And here are four points. These are your final graph. So negative three, negative one, negative four, one, negative seven, three, negative 12, five. Does this appear as a radical? It sort of does. 
we'll trust a little bit of our work, but does it make sense that this is horizontally flipped? Yes. Does it make sense that this was vertically stretched? Sure, it looks a little bit vertically stretched. Has this shifted three left and one down? Yes, I feel confident with this now in saying that this exists everywhere to the left or equal to a negative three. I feel confident that this exists everywhere above or equal to negative one and there's a domain in a range. Now if we were to try to do a similar question about um, going from the graph to the equation and how has the shape changed, where's the location, um, we first might look at flips and stretches. So when I look at this, I do notice that it, this exists sort of from an end point. That's four to the right, one up. I know that this shifted up one and right four. I also know that this looks like it's been flipped to the left. Flipped left, so maybe a horizontal flip. This exists up, so I know there's no vertical flip, but so now we can talk about a shape change. Well, I do know that the square root of x graph typically would go one over, one up, pretending this is sort of an origin location. One, two, three, four over, two up. Does it do this? Well, no. If I examine this vertically, it appears that an input of one should, uh, input of one should be at a one, but it's at a two. An input of four should be at a two, but it's up to a four. So it's almost like vertically we're stretching this times two. And that is another scenario. It's a vertical stretch times two. So in examining this, the, the shape, this is vertically being stretched times two. So we could say it as an equation, vertically stretching times two, horizontally flipping, factored right four, and up one. That is not an easy 